Thank you very much for having me, guys. And thank you, Dave, for uh, you know, uh, bringing me down and doing all the things that you do. So if you guys want to tweet anything about this while we're here, um, screenshots, anything like that, that's my Twitter name up there. It's probably my most active social media channel because it doesn't take a lot of thought. So I can put my foot in my mouth as many times as I want. Just blast out 140 characters and, uh, you know, and then cross my fingers. And then that's my website too, ericvallon.com. If you have any questions and uh, concerns, emails, you want to keep track of my work and what I'm doing, that's the best place to, uh, to check out. So let me start her off. This is our class. It's uh, controlling the light. That's our whole goal. I'm going to teach you how to do that through different modifiers, better understanding of lighting theory, and basically uh, the manual controls and everything on your camera. So thank you very much for coming out. Uh, New York's a lot of fun to teach in because most of the time, it's usually in the most active crowds that I'll ever get to talk to um, anywhere in the country that I've been fortunate enough to speak at. So throw the questions out there. Um, if I, I refer it to it later, I'll be glad to take as many questions as possible after the class. And hopefully I answer all your questions in the slides that I've got coming up. So has anyone gone online and seen my website at all? Or you just thought it was like, man, I get to hang out in the toy store for a couple hours and let's do this. A couple people? OK, cool. Well, just to, uh, just to tell you a little bit about me so you don't wonder who the stranger is talking up here, uh, my name's Eric Valland. I've got a couple people in the crowd that have known me for a while and a couple uh, are just seeing me for the first time. But I couldn't really think of a, a cool creative name that had like photos somewhere in it. Um, so I just kind of, you know, copped out and made my, my company Eric Valland Photography. Um, so what I do instead of a unique name with a cool ring and catchy thing to it, I just call, tell myself Eric with a K. Uh, how many people have gone out, met someone, shaken a hand, two seconds later turned around and totally not remember their name. It's happened to a couple of people? Okay, cool. Well, I, I latch onto the whole K thing because if I introduce myself different, like, hey, I'm Eric with a K, and hopefully we have a meaningful conversation or, or talk for a couple seconds, it's a little, little device that hopefully they remember my name. So if they're Googling, I know this photographer named Eric, I remember liking his work, you know, maybe at least they get Eric with a K right. I think it had a V somewhere in it, and hopefully Google is nice to me and puts me up there at like one of the top pages and they can find my work later on. So uh, that's, uh, that's how I brand myself. I'm a commercial photographer. I think that just means I get paid. I don't think that means I'm better than anyone else there. There's so many amazing shooters of all different uh, skill levels and financial brackets, but I shoot for a living. So fortunate enough to be able to walk around and teach and take pictures, and that's how I pay all my bills. But I was originally born, uh, born and raised in Florida. I had, to, I had to think about that twice, because I'm living in Detroit now. I've got, I'm somehow migrating north. You know how when you retire, you're supposed to retire south? you know, to the Caribbean, to Florida, things like that. Well, I was born and raised in Florida, and I seem to be retiring north because I'm now uh, based out of Detroit. And if you catch me in another five or 10 years, I'll probably be halfway through Canada and uh, keep going that way. But that really is what got me started in photography. Uh, my grandfather was a shooter full time. Uh, my mother took a lot of cool pictures, but what really got me started in photography was the action sports and all the cool stuff that I was fortunate enough to do growing up as a kid. Anyone in here gone surfing? Been to Hawaii, been to Florida? Anyone been to Florida? Yeah. Okay, we've got a couple people nodding their head. Okay, cool. Florida, we have a lot of beach. We're that little part way, way down in the south side of the country that sticks out into the ocean or the Gulf anyways. We've got tons of beach. So growing up, uh, before, after school, sometimes during school, uh, we'd skip out and we'd go skimboarding, surfing, wakeboarding, you name it. If we could get going on the water and ride on it, I think some friends and I even tried to, uh, tried to go wakeboarding on McDonald's trays that we once borrowed from a McDonald's that was there on the water and we got it to work. So needless to say, we were doing some pretty fun things that we thought at the time. But we'd be out there for weeks or days or hours, whatever it was, trying to land these tricks. And say you land like a really neat trick behind the boat, you go back in. The only people that ever saw it happen were those three guys. And it lost something in translation when you're going back, like, oh my god, did you see so-and-so just landed that 360 today? It was amazing. People are like, 360, that's cool, what's that? Well, he spun around in the air once. You know, all of a sudden, it's not as exciting. So one of the reasons I picked up a camera was, to basically be able to record those cool events, to go back, show my friends and family and stuff, all the fun things we were doing. And uh, that was kind of what, what really like, bit the bug. You know? um, who here has a cool story about first time they picked up a camera? Why'd you ever want to take a picture? Anyone? Get hit with like a passion and? I, I, I travel for a living, and uh, I started going to amazing places. And speaking of surfing, I was in Hawaii trying to take pictures of surfers, and I had to stand in front of the Mill Point Chi by Best Buy. I got so sick and tired of not being able to capture what I saw and take it home and show it to friends and family. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's so cool. That, that's exactly what it is. I think a lot of photography and why I'm so hooked on it and why I'm, I'm really happy to be able to share it with people is that. Is going out and seeing a really cool thing that you want to share with people, but not knowing technically how to capture it like you see it or how you see it in your mind's eye. So when you go back and share it with people, it's like, 
eh, but it was a lot better if you're there. You'd have to be there to get it. Like, I didn't want to have to tell people that when showing my pictures. I didn't want to have to have that voiceover. So that's one of the reasons down towards the bottom where I started to get into lighting. The other half of my upbringing in photography or, or when I was first starting out as event photography. Uh, after growing up on the beach, I made the bad decision to move away from the beach into the middle of the state to Orlando. It really wasn't that bad. We have Disney World and all those fancy things. But I went to school at uh, UCF over in Orlando, uh, University of Central Florida. And I did uh, a lot of event photography throughout the years while I was there. I shot through college. And I was fortunate enough to work with some cool clients like uh, AOL, um, Wells Fargo were a couple of them. Bigger clients that had budgets to do productions. So uh, when I say event photography, I lucked out. We had, I think the Orange County Convention Center is one of the top two or three in the country. And what was neat about that is these big companies would come in and they wouldn't just have events in a boring space. They had to try to get their vendors and stuff to show up. So they would like make massive ice bars. Like they would have the part of the convention center and they would have people come down and really carve blocks of ice and have like a massive ice bar and transform the whole thing into the Antarctica for like a weekend to try to get vendors to come out to their expos. So I got to shoot events at these places and started seeing like the production value where if I wasn't traveling at a cool location or in Puerto Rico or on the beaches in Florida somewhere, I was in a convention center and saw what you could do to create these cool environments and locations. So I think I shot a job for Wells Fargo and you know how their big thing is their stagecoach? They have like one of three handmade stagecoaches like in the world still. They had like one of these primo guys build this thing and I got to shoot an event and stage people all around this thing which was a riot. So between those two, capturing action and neat people and seeing these great environments, whether I was there in person or whether people were producing these things, I really decided after school that I wanted to hang my shingle out there. I was going to be a people photographer, but more importantly, I wanted to be a location people photographer. And if I couldn't find that cool location or get the budget to go there to take the pictures, I was really interested in finding ways to use lighting or props and things to build up a cool location to put my people in. So I very seldom shoot in a studio. I totally dig being on location, and a lot of the time, that means uh, inconveniences of dragging a lot of gear. I guess I kind of sell my imagery as being vibrant and energetic, but what were the, some of the main things that you saw in your travel photography that you weren't getting? Was it, would you ever go to try to take a picture of someone and you get them exposed and like the sky is blown out white? Does that ever happen to anybody? That, was, that doesn't lend to that vibrant, energetic imagery when you take a picture of someone and you get them in focus and get them exposed and all of a sudden your beautiful blue skies and the palm trees in the background are overexposed and you can't see them in the picture. That's what I wanted to get away from. So I realized I needed to start adding light to the image to balance it out. If you, uh, if you, you guys know about HDR photography, right? The high dynamic range. That, they came around with that because our eyes can see all kinds of light. You guys can see me under the spotlight, but you can still see detail in the shadows and stuff over here. Our cameras don't have that much latitude. Our cameras can't see as broad a spectrum as light as our eyes can. So you can either take HDR images, which mash a whole bunch of pictures together, or you can learn how to light. So I can come in and light the dark areas to even out the exposure so my camera can capture that. I thought that was a lot easier to do. And if you've ever tried to take an HDR of a guy moving down a wave, it's almost impossible to do. You need a static image. So I decided to light everything. And I had to learn how to pack light to do that. Because your friends very quickly turn against you if every time you go on a trip or go somewhere, you ask them to help you lug three cases of gear and carry it down to the beach and carry it back up and hold their light stands all day. You very quickly get uninvited to a lot of trips. Um, so that's why I started using small flash. It was out of necessity. It was either that don't have friends or you know learn how to use smaller lights. So I decided to go with smaller lights. Um, that's basically the backstory and how I came here. Just so you know, I didn't pick up one day and decide, oh, these flashes are cool. Let's do this. There's, they serve a lot of purposes. And uh, hopefully, when you walk away here, we'll show you how to control those a little more, so you can walk out into those cool spots and locations and knock out some killer portraits because you're able to balance the exposures a little more. So does anyone have any questions before we kick it off? Solid? All right. The picture over on the left-hand side is, uh, I think that was stereotypical Detroit area when I moved up there. It had just, the snow was just melting. It was cold. It was rainy. Um, it, it looked like it was probably going to snow or rain, and I think it did 20 minutes after we took this photo. And that wasn't the kind of image I wanted to go out and take that day. I'm from Florida. I wanted like those sunsets, the beautiful skies, that kind of stuff. So to get that, I just added one flash to the picture with an orange piece of plastic. It's called a CTO gel over my flash. You can see it there in the background on the left. And that allowed me to stream over the shoulder and get those neat sun flares and warm up my picture. So with one flash, I didn't add fill to the picture, but I flooded the picture with light. And I made it my own color to warm it up like a sunset. And I walked away with the image on the right. And this right here, I've got two simple lights. One's on his back. It just 
totally bare. There's nothing else on it. I've got it hanging up there to look like it's the ceiling light. And the front one is another one of these little guys that I taped inside of his machine. Now this was, um, this guy owns a couple bars in Orlando and I was hired to take a headshot of him for just like a write-up for one of the monthly magazines and everything. They were going to do a story on him about uh, his bars and a party that he was throwing. So I went in there and I got the normal shot, the safe shot, you know, the head shot that you stereotypically see. And then um, we were hanging around for a little bit and he was cool, so he gave me a couple more minutes to shoot. So I'm like, you know, let's try something else. This is his video game he's got in his green room, in his office. So I came up with this concept, you know, the whole smoke, like Tron kind of thing, you know. I don't know if Ed Tron had been out because this is a pretty old picture yet, but the, old, the original Tron was. So for this one, I put one flash behind him, which was already set up, and then I put one more in the machine, and it was blasting him in the face. But it just didn't work. It was like this, he was bright here, but you, didn't, you couldn't understand why. So I grabbed a couple of guys who were outside in the bar smoking. I had three of them inhale really quick, run into the room, and then exhale onto his computer screen, and that's how I got the shot. So this just shows how, with a little bit of creativity and a light or two, I mean, you can get some really cool portraits. I mean, the sky's the limit here, literally, uh, with what you can do with these small flashes, because you can place them anywhere. So once you understand how to control them, we can really do some cool things. So how many people here have speed lights already and are kind of doing some of this strobus kind of shooting? Yeah, a good portion? How many people are shooting um, people without lights? So majority, there's a lot of people shooters in here. Okay, cool. Well, what is it that you look for when you get a flash and you set it up like this, you set up an umbrella, and you go to light somebody? What is it that you look for in the picture? How do you know if you're doing it right? Does anyone have an idea? No? You guys all just go turn your lights on whatever setting and just start firing away? What do you base it off of? Take a test. Take a test? Yeah. What are you looking for in that test? If it looks good. If it looks good? Okay. What criteria are you using to judge good? I'm usually adjusting it for the background. The background. That's interesting. We're gonna I'll show you how we can do a couple different things to get our background. Are you guys looking at the highlights? Yeah. yeah. That's what I used to do. I used to grab a flash and I think, I'm lighting this image, so I'm gonna put the most weight on the light. I'm gonna see where the light falls. How many people on the right see a girl's face? Pretty much everyone, I hope, right? Otherwise I've been looking at this picture too long. How many of you guys see a saxophone player? A couple more. Come on, you guys are New Yorkers, most of you anyways. Come on, I'm getting a few, way farther opinions than I did this morning. Uh, but on the left, do you see two faces looking at each other? Yeah, that's how I used to approach lighting when I first started. I figured, I have a light, I'm lighting the picture, everything says light, that's all that I'm going to look at. So I figured if the highlights on the face were properly exposed, it had to be a good shot. I couldn't understand why a lot of my photos were lacking drama, or why they didn't have like a contrast or an impact I wanted. It's because I was only really looking at half of the equation. The other half is the shadows. The shadows, I want to say, like, it's totally a lame pun, but overshadow the light in most aspects because the shadows are where your dramas live. It's where all the contrast is. It's that balance between the light and the shadow, that tension there, that dance, that actually makes a good image. So when you're looking at a picture, don't lose the shadow and the contrast that you're creating in the picture by looking at the light. We're casting light to create those shadows. Those shadows are what give us the depth. If you look at a snapshot where it's the person getting blasted in the face with light, the reason we unconsciously don't like that picture is because there's no shadows. You took a very pretty three-dimensional human being and turned them into a flat character, and not a very flattering one either, not funny. Um, and that's why we don't like the snapshots right off the bat. We're not the first people to realize this either. Um, do we have any Italians in here? Yeah, OK, who said that? Can you say it a little louder? Perfect. This is basically the term light and dark. It's an Italian term just like there. I give my shout out to Wikipedia at the bottom. I, I swear I would have passed college all over again if you know, I had known about Wikipedia or used it more. Um, but basically, uh, everyone's been using this. Woodcutters have been using this. Painters have been using this forever. Uh, cinematographer nowadays. They, we don't just look at the one to, uh, for the exclusion of the other. You don't just look at the light. A lot of times it's your shadow that creates the image. So that's why this term means light and dark interchangeably. You can't have one without the other. There's no point in lighting a scene if we're not consciously making the shadows what we want them to be. And that's why if you study classic portrait, they have all these fancy names for all these lighting setups. All the lighting setups describe the shadows you create with your light rather than the kind of light that you're casting on your model's faces. All right, there's rules. There's not a whole bunch. I don't think I would have gotten into photography if there were many of them. Um, and photographer math is usually set as simple as two or divide by two times by two. That's all you need to know. Um, here are two steadfast rules that these are the ones you can't break, but these are the ones that are great to know. So as you try to shape your light, you know how to get the kind of light you're looking for. The larger the light source, the softer the light. 
which means a massive light source is going to create a big wrapping light that's more pleasing and soft on a subject. The closer the light source, the softer the light. How big is the sun? Pretty massive, right? Why is it that if you go out at noon and you take a picture of someone under the noonday sunlight, do they have such harsh shadows and such an unflattering light? You guys know why? You think it was the biggest light source out there, it should be the softest light. So far away. So far away, exactly. The distance. If I stand up there and I'm looking at the sun, I can put my thumb over the sun. It doesn't matter how big it is, it has to also be in relation to your subject. That's what that means. So if I have a flash, I swear I've got one here, there we go. If I have a flash, it's a very small light source, and by small I'm relating it to the subject matter. So if I'm taking a picture of myself, this light is smaller than me, so it's going to create a very harsh light. No matter how close I bring it, it's tiny. But if I have a larger light source and bring it in closer like this umbrella, all of a sudden the light source is larger than me in this relationship, so this is considered a large light source that would be a softer light because it would spread out and wrap away. I'll show you really quickly what that looks like. This is a very large light source, a very soft light. It was also brought in very close. I purposely did everything I could according to those two rules that we know about hard and soft light to make this light as soft as possible. Um, I can show you really quick what I used to make this actually too. Got a seven foot parabolic, this guy. So we went from the image that we had previously, which was created by this light source, and then we went all the way up to, pardon me if I blind anyone in the front row, a seven foot umbrella. So this is what I used. So it got a little bit bigger in relation to our model. And the thing is, I used a shoot through too, which is neat. Because the closest I can get a bounce to my model is this big. But the shoot through, I can put her right at the other end and I just cropped right out. So I mean this thing was like inches from her face and seven foot. The model wasn't seven foot. So this was a very big soft wrapping light. So that's the very high end of the other spectrum right there. And if you, I, I can't tell where the shadow begins or where the highlight begins in that picture and that means it's super, super soft light. How did it spread the beam? Spread the beam? Use the diffuser or just wide angle on the flash? Just wide angle on the flash, yep. That's a great question. The question was how did I diffuse the beam? Basically what he's talking about is the light coming out of here is a beam of light. I can focus it to be a direct beam of light, or I can zoom it out to 24 millimeters and be a wider beam of light. And what I did is I pulled it all the way back and zoomed it out so it, the beam would spread enough to cover the hole inside of the, uh, of the umbrella. So that's a great question. Oh, thank you. Do I have any other questions about hard and soft light? Yeah. How about using the diffusion zone or pull out diffuser? Both, yes, actually. When I use the shoot through umbrella, since this photograph, I've started using the cap on it. Very good question. He asked if I use the diffusion dome, which would allow me to spread the light out even more than 24 millimeters. I'm going to come back to those in a little bit when I talk about modifiers, but the answer is yes. No. Mm -hmm. just, just one or the other. That'd be neat to kind of stack them, but I'm afraid I would lose a lot of light. Mm -hmm. What's the uh, difference between a silver reflector and a white reflector? The question was what's the difference between a silver and a white reflector? Silver light is going to be more spectral. So if you look at my face, if I've been sweating a little bit, there's going to be a hard hot spot here and fade over. If you use a white, that's not going to be such a distinct hot spot on the people's skin. So your highlights will become less spectral. Uh huh? Yeah, you, you said about the diffusing the light onto the. Explain that. How, how, do, you, how do you do that? Oh, yeah, good question. I'm going to come back to that when I go through equipment. I'm going to explain how I use a flash with different uh, modifiers and how to get the most out of them. Okay. So I'll definitely come back to that. This picture right here, it's hard light on the left, soft light on the right. We know that because we talked about how quick we transfer to the shadow. But I like these because if you look over here, look at the shadows they cast. Not just the shadows they create on the face, but the shadows your subjects cast. If you look over on the left hand side, that shadow is just as harsh and defined as the shadow on her face. And on the one on the right, the shadow is almost non-existent. So if you've ever looked at those high fashion photos where they've got them on like the white seamless paper or like the psych walls and things like that, and you wonder how they get like the shadows to almost disappear, they're using very, very big light modifiers, like eight, nine, 10 foot parab or, um, octobanks, parabolics like that one you saw there, um, all kinds of crazy equipment. I mean, they have to go really big to get the light that soft to be able to cast a shadow where it almost disappears. So that's how they do that. That's why if you go home or you go into a home studio or a small studio or a spare room or whatever and you take a picture and you wonder why you're getting these shadows on the wall, chances are you need a softer light source. That's one of the biggest questions I get and was a big hurdle for me. I'm like, why the heck am I getting those gross shadows on the wall? I want that soft, pretty picture like you see in the magazines. Nope, you need a softer light to do it. So that's exactly how.
All right. Now that we've talked about hard and soft light and the different reasons uh, why we would use them and how we can make them, I want to talk about the different angles of light. So now we've got a light quality that we like. We have to figure out where we're going to place our light. I'm going to get into details on that, but there's different ways of placing the light and different, uh, different outcomes we can get for it and different reasons we would do it. Uh, this shot right here, I didn't want a shadow, because remember I said shadows create drama and contrast and interest in an image? If I had shadows over here on the side of her face or over here under her chin, they would have distracted from the eyes that I wanted to balance with the necklace. They would have taken away from it. So I decided to use flat lighting. If I could have my model step up for a second for me. I'll show you exactly where I put it. Same way we get that gross flat, flat lighting when we use an on-camera flash, I did the same thing to get the flat lighting here. So I'll have you uh, step up that way. All I did was do this. I had a, a soft box, a little bit bigger than this actually, but I stood right here, right on camera axis. The light was on the same axis as my camera lens was. I shot the picture, and that's the picture I got. That's why there's no shadows. The only thing I did is knowing hard and soft light, I made the light source big enough that it would be a soft shadowless light, so it was a pleasing flat light, as opposed to a not so pleasing hard like spotlight snapshot kind of shot. So that's why uh, we would use flat light. I don't use it a ton, but for people with like a beautiful complexion or eyes, or if there's something you really want to show off, you can get away with it. This is Rembrandt lighting. This is, uh, this is almost like you would put it at 45 degrees or about there. This, instead of going right on camera like this and not creating any shadow, I move in the flash over here, and she's looking over this way, so that I'm creating just enough shadow. Again, like I said, we're fortunate enough to work with, with really beautiful people, so why do we want to go ahead and turn them into these flat characters of a people when we take a picture of them? If you look here, by moving the light over, this is our flat light, by moving the light over this way, we're creating enough shadow over here that we see that she's a beautiful three-dimensional woman. And that's the point of the Rembrandt lighting and moving it over there like that. And I keep saying Rembrandt lighting because he was notorious for this little, uh, this little dollop of light that he put right there under the eye. He did that in a lot of his paintings, he did that in most of his self-portraits, but that little triangle of highlight under that eye is why we call it Rembrandt lighting. But basically, he was a master of using the chiaroscuro. Is that how you say it? The light in the dark, the balance there. I wish I had an Italian accent. But uh, he, was no he was notorious for that. He was a master of it. So that's why there's so much passion, depth, and creativity in his work, because he had deep shadows, yet like highlights that would just rivet you to that part of the scene and then let you wash over the rest of it. And that's, uh, that's what made him one of the masters. But we can employ that every day when we're taking pictures with our camera, doing the exact same thing. So it's two different examples of that. I was at the airport yesterday flying over here, and I was laid over in Chicago, and um, I was on Petapixel. Has anyone gone to that website? Petapixel, Petapixel, something like that. It's one of, the, uh, one of the big photo blogs. They aggregate all kinds of cool content and have neat articles and things. But there was this guy over there. His name is Quentin Arnaud. But anyways, they did a write-up on him in a series that he did, and the series was called Shape. He's a French photographer. I haven't even seen the rest of his website, but this came up in my RSS feed. I was going through my iPad looking at blogs and stuff. I'm like, oh, these pictures are cool. And I was just tweaking this presentation, talking about rim lighting. I'm like, if this isn't the best example of that, I don't know what is. So I didn't take these photos. It was that French gentleman right there on the bottom. Haven't even seen the rest of his work, but if he's as creative as this, and I think you might, might definitely want to check it out or do a Google search on him for sure. Are there any questions on that? Because that's a, that's a lot of the theory of the light, like the different features and different characteristics of light. Now we're going to go into more the nuts and bolts, like the boring, real stuff that you have to know in your sleep inside and out to be able to get the cool results from all the theory we talked about. No questions? You guys got it locked down? All right. How many people uh, started shooting on film? Good, OK, there's a lot of you. How many people still shoot film? What's the fastest shutter speed you ever bought film-wise and didn't feel bad about it when you developed it? 1600? OK. 3200. What kind of film was that? Tri-X. Tri-X? OK. Oh, I was going to say, oh my goodness. That's, that's, that's daring, even on today's sensors. That's pretty ballsy. But that, OK, very cool. I like this gentleman because nowadays on most of the cameras, my camera now is three years old. If you walked out into the store and you went and asked the camera guys, like, how high they would turn their ISOs out here, I mean, they'd, I shoot regular at 1600, 3200 ISO not even worrying about it. I mean, I might do minor noise reduction in the Lightroom later on when I get home, but anything below 3200, like, I'm not, I'm not worried at all. Um, and that's one of the things that I really, especially people that started working on film, 
I want to ingrain in your head is ISO is now a variable. ISO used to be used to be like lead weight. It used to be a ball and chain. You used to put in a roll of film. You were stuck at 400 ISO, 800 ISO, ASA, whatever it was, and that was it. So if you wanted more light, you had to use your shutter speed or your aperture. That was it. Now with digital, we can go ahead and I'll take one picture at 400 ISO, one picture at 6400 ISO, not a whole bunch of difference anymore. So it's actually a tool that we can have in our belt when we're shaping and controlling light. So for all you film shooters, I learned on film as well, I mean, ingrain that in there that ISO needs to be played with. Now that we're over that though, ISO needs to be controlled globally, or is controlled, it controls everything globally. And what I mean by that is look at it like a scale game with your shutter and your aperture, you give and take with each of them. When you change your ISO to be more sensitive to light, you get more light all across the board. When you make it less sensitive, you lose light all across the board. So uh, it's really good to get your balance. You have to do the dance between these two to get your exposure, and then you can raise them all or lower them all all together like that. So I'll show you a little bit something about shutter speed. How many people uh, shoot at night? You guys like night photography? Is it night street photography or you landscapes or what are you shooting? Stars. Stars. Awesome. Okay. Anyone else? Street. street photography. Okay. So do you use a flash or are you just kind of panning with people because you have a slow shutter? Uh, use a tripod. Tripod. Okay, cool. What he's saying, I, I imagine for the stars you're using a tripod as well. Most of the time when you're outdoors, especially at night, you have to use a really show, uh, slow shutter speed. Is everyone in here um, work in their camera in manual mode? A couple people are? Okay. As soon as you go out there, they'll tell you that P is for professional mode. That's all you need. Just go out and shoot. doesn't matter what camera you buy. That'll only get you so far. So I want after everyone leaves here to at least half the time if they're not already, make sure that you're in full manual mode. And that way you can really start grasping how your shutter speed affects an image how you're getting motion blur induced, how you're getting more of that low light when you're uh, right at dusk or nighttime and things. And then also how your aperture throws things out of focus. So if you've got a really wide open aperture and you're getting a lot of light coming in, how your background goes to soft focus really quickly. So if you're not doing that already, definitely make sure that you're in manual mode because it totally unlocks complete control. And that's what this, uh, this whole thing is about. So then we can break all the rules. So really quickly, shutter speed. I'm going to pray here that Lightroom is playing nice. And I'm going to go ahead and switch over to show you an example of shutter speed down here. There we go. Really quick. I shot this last night. This is what I, I love about this city is you can come any time of day or night and you'll probably find someone of like mind or a model or someone that's down to go take pictures. I literally, I flew in last night. I, uh, I met up with my friend and I'm like, I sent out a couple text messages. I'm like, I was on the plane. I thought of a really cool example. I need to get example images of shutter speed for tomorrow's presentation at, not, at 11 in the morning was my first one. So sure enough, here I am at like 11 last night taking these pictures to show you guys. So awesome, awesome. Like I said, I'm really glad to be here teaching this. But I'm going to go ahead and set it up so that you can see what my, uh, what my exposure settings were here. I made them go away. Can you see them now? Perfect. So I'm at 1 250th of a second. Now, if you remember the slide that I showed you, if you read the fine print behind it, the shutter speed controls the ambient light. What's the ambient light? Street. 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 Yeah, it's the existing light. It's the light that's there before we start adding light. It's the light that if we slow down our shutter speed, more of it leaks in like this. What I want you to see though is shutter speed only affects ambient light. So you can have your shutter as fast and slow you want. And as long as you're within the sync speed of your camera, you're going to get a picture that's not messing up your exposure with your flash. So think of it as every time you use flash and you're taking a picture, there's two pictures being taken. There's one picture being exposed by your light and one picture being exposed by your ambient light. And shutter speed allows you to play with that ambient independently of the other one. So watch what happens as I go down in shutter speed. I'm at 1 250th of a second, 1 one twenty fifth, 1 60th of a second, 1 30th of a second, 1 15th. Where did those people come from? Like there weren't people there earlier, you know? So again, these guys were nice enough to come out and help me at 11 o'clock at night on a, on a drop of a hat. So I've got good friends. But basically, what we did here is look at her now. Just look at the model now that you've seen it for effect. Still watching her? She didn't change. That exposure did not change a bit. So when we're out there and we're going to start using our off-camera light, we're going to use it in a couple of different ways, shutter speed gives you maximum control because you can make your ambient and your environment appear and be an active part of the image, or you can make it go away entirely and just focus on your subject and what you decide to light. So if you, I swear, I, I dial my, my poor button or my poor roller here on the back of the camera is probably going to be the first thing to wear out on this guy because I ride my shutter speed more than any other setting when I'm shooting, any other setting. 
because it can give me like 10 different looks. Like these are all different photographs and all I did was change my shutter speed. My model, my light, nothing changed. So you just got to definitely keep that in mind that uh, that's the way to go. Shutter speed only controls your ambient light. Aperture, I wish there was an aperture value I could give you and I could just say go shoot f8 and like you're going to be good all the time. Uh, people always ask like where do you start? What are your settings on that? Um, aperture controls your flash power and it controls your depth of field. So aperture is totally to feel. I can't give you a real answer on that. I can tell you though if I take a picture and I light my model and she's, she's too hot, she's overexposed, instead of walking all the way over to my, flat, my flash and turning it down, I can stop down my aperture one stop and get the exact same effect. You will be stopping down your ambient also and that's why when we opened up we talked that it's a dance. That was a very good question. He mentioned that when you stop down your aperture and let less light in, you're getting less light from your flash, and that's when you would ride that shutter button again and just slow down your shutter speed to let more light in to balance it out. It's global just like ISO, no? Uh, yeah, it is global like ISO, but ISO is going to do everything independently, and aperture is the best way to dial your flash down without riding that. But yes, it, can, it is a global one as well. Aperture, for you guys that um, aren't 100% familiar, aperture is basically the hole and how much how wide it is open to let light in. So if I'm at like an aperture of like f22, it's going to let less light in. If I'm at aperture 2.8, it's a lot more open, so it's going to let more light in. And that's why it's a global one because all the ambient and your flashlight is rushing in because the floodgates are open. So aperture controls your flash power. Flash shutter speed is how you then compensate with your ambient light. And then once you get your good balance and you decide the whole thing's a little dark or the whole thing's a little light, then you use your ISO to globally change it. So it's definitely a balance and a dance between those three at all times. Any other questions? No? You guys are just eating this all up. Did you guys, like, you guys should have come to the advanced class, right? Like, you guys have this all down already? You're, like, twiddling your thumbs? Okay. Well, cool. This is, um, I'm going to get off the camera setting, and we're going to go back to light. Shaping light, uh, different ways we can control light, because now we know the basic settings to uh, control the light. Once we've got it out there in a shape that we like, we can change it on the fly. So I'm going to ask my model to come back up. I'm going to switch over here. Awesome. And you notice on the top that it says non-camera access. Um, if, you were if you remembered earlier, earlier on I was talking about on-camera access, which means the light was firing right down the barrel of the lens, which doesn't give it any shadow, it doesn't give us any uh, depth or any contrast or drama in the shadows. So that's what we want to avoid. But what if you're at an event, like you're at a, how many people photograph weddings? A couple wedding photographers. Do we have event photographers, corporate event photographers, that kind of stuff? How many people just want to know how to like take better pictures of your friends and family? Like we're in holiday season. Like who wants to be able to show up and take awesome photos of your friends and family because you know you're not going to get to see them again until next year? Cool. In that case then, you're probably out there and the flash is stuck on the camera because no one wants you around the table um, with a light stand and an umbrella and getting in everyone's way. They're trying to cook, they're trying to feed you, you know, the little ones are running around knocking your stuff over. So chances are you're going to be, uh, you're going to have your flash on your camera. And you're going to have to uh, forgive me here because I'm going to take some horrible photographs of you, for example, and then I'm only going to try to make them better, okay? So we'll switch back over. And if anyone's wondering, I'm using Lightroom. Lightroom rocks. There we go. And you guys can see my settings down there on the bottom. It's ISO 400, f5.6, and we're at 1 80th of a second. But like I said, the settings really don't matter because to get what I want, we're going to change them up all over the place. We're going to change all of them. So this is where most of us begin. We've got our flash. I'm going to set it on TTL mode. TTL is basically through the lens metering, it's auto mode for your flash. There's nothing wrong with auto mode for your flash when we've got it like this because I'm going to show you some bouncing things and I'm not that good at math that I could do that in my head and do it manually with any reliability. So this is kind of what we, uh, what we begin with as a base and I'm going to have to apologize because this is really bad snapshot quality and this is not what you guys are here to see. We're just going to make sure our tethering session is working. Okay, cool. So now that we know a little bit about light, we understand why we think that's a horrible photograph. We can all agree that that's a pretty bad photograph, right? Okay, everyone's nodding their head. Okay, that's pretty bad. But if we're stuck here, if we don't have an assistant and we don't have the room or the time or we're not allowed to set up a light stand in the house, the best thing to do is get the light off camera access like we had it here and we can bounce it. This would be my first go-to thing. 
So we're going to bounce off the ceiling in this case. I love how they've got beautiful white ceilings. So vent space rocks and for this reason. There we go. Beautiful. So the exact same shot, I didn't move, my settings didn't change, but instead of shooting right down the barrel of the lens, I bounced off the ceiling and all of a sudden we have a different look. Still not a best, like my best image, that's for sure, but what if I did a, it works for Lightroom too, this clicker rocks. What if we did something like that and then very quickly we did something like that. I think if I had an option between the two, I'd go with this one. You guys with me? Yeah. All right, cool. Now if you're really lucky and you've got like this low white wall, you guys realize what I'm doing right. I'm using this as like a giant softbox. This light right here went from a little light source. First off, it's off camera axis, so it's creating some shadows that we like, but notice how soft the shadows are. It's because we went from a small hard light source to a giant softbox. Like I couldn't set up one that big up here, but we've got the ceiling, so might as well use it. Yep? What do you do if you have a, like a color group, like a green group? Yeah, go to shoot black and white. <laughs> All the way. I'll definitely get to that. I'm going to show you something a little bit next so we can work around that. Can you bounce it off the screen uh, as if it were a wall, like right now? Ab absolutely, yeah. Uh -huh. he's, 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 he's leading it now. Ready? I'll have you look over this way for me a little bit. Beautiful. I totally stole that. Thank you. <laughs> no, but um, if you're really lucky, you'll have a low white ceiling, but you also have a wall that you can bounce off. Now that looks like I just set up a big softbox or an umbrella over to the, my right, and I'm shooting at my model, and you wouldn't tell that I've got an on-camera flash that two seconds ago was this, this, you know? All of a sudden we've gone to this, which I like a lot, lot more. So yes. Yep? Would the light be any better if you tilted it toward, toward her? Toward horror? Yeah. The question was, would the light be any better if you tilted it? Yes. What I would do right now, I have this this way, so it's only bouncing off the wall. That would allow the light to go ahead and bleed onto her and bounce off. So you'd be mixing direct light with bounced light. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing better. But if you needed a little more juice, that's possible. Not as far as bleeding a thing, but as far as hitting the wall at an angle, that it would bounce off more. Do you play pool? <laughs> no? Yes. Yeah, he, basically the question was, what if you bounced it, I guess, um, at more of an angle? Yeah. yeah, so you like your angle of incidence and then back out. Like when bouncing off the ceiling also, why shoot 90 degrees? Why not just put it the next thing from the because if I'm doing this, usually it's not a controlled environment, like I'm, I'm shooting an event or something. Yeah. So it's safe to have it directly up, because I know I'm not going to bump it and then accidentally get this harsh light hitting her in the face. I know for sure it's only going to hit the ceiling when I do this. So I mean, a lot of the time if we're outside of the studio and this is on flash, it's not optimum, you know, optimum environment. Well, if you go on set angle, it increases the chance of shadows on the axis. Yep. So, so what he, he said there's, um, you create different shadows too. If you hitting them directly on, it eats up the shadows rather than bouncing off the ceiling and creating the shadows underneath. So it's a mix. So play with it, for sure. There's no right or wrong about this. These are just things to keep in mind. Bouncing off to this, bouncing off the ceiling. Oh, there we go. There you, oh, no, that's not it. And there we go, cool. See, if you look in her eye right there, I think this is what you might have been mentioning. See the little spectral highlight in her eye right there? That's because we tilted it down just a little bit that we were getting direct on camera flash here. So definitely play with it. Again there, this is tilted down a little bit, so just a little bit of light skimming in there and creating a little highlight in her eye, but the majority of it is getting bounced off the ceiling. So definitely play around with it, and then keep in mind that you can mix some on camera. A lot of the time if I'm using multiple lights, I'll have one light coming in with a soft box, and I'll still have one almost on camera access for a nice little fill light. So if you cheat it, you can almost get both of the best, like the best of both worlds with just one light, which is really cool. Are you in manual now? I'm in manual on my camera, yeah. um, but the flash is on auto. That's because, okay. oh, go on. And do you, do you have it set at? Uh, uh, TTL. Yeah. Yep, so it's in auto mode. So I know I'm controlling all my ambient light, but that right there is um, going auto. So it bounces off something, it sends a little pulse, comes back down, gets a reading off of it, and then decides its own output. Usually when we're this close, it works pretty well. Now, what if you're at a wedding or something like that, and you have 50-foot black ceilings in whatever building you're in, and there's no walls in sight, and you're just in trouble? You can melt your flash by pointing it straight up and trying to bounce 100 feet off of a black ceiling, or you can do something like this. This is a TTL cable. I'm going to switch back over here to our slideshow. If you want to grab a seat for a second, you're more than welcome to. This is the next step when it comes to our uh, off-camera flash. Where'd the trigger go? 
Oops, I think I broke PowerPoint. I think that's what I get for running PowerPoint on a Mac. There we go. First thing we just talked about was bounce flash. That flash up there rotates for a reason. I mean, when you get out of here, definitely go play with all the different flashes out there on the floor. I mean, they rotate all the way back if you want them to. So you can get whatever angle you want. So I can shoot down on my model if I wanted even and still bounce off the ceiling. So if I wanted to shoot down like this. Or if I'm at a wedding and I'm shooting like tabletop decorations or whatever, you know, I can go ahead, bounce off the ceiling or bounce off the wall. So they definitely rotate for you to rotate them. I don't think the manufacturer fully intended for you ever just leave them full steam ahead, you know, blinding people like that. So bounce off whatever you can. But if we don't have anything to bounce off of, the next best thing is going to be a TTL cable, which is this guy. It rocks because basically connecting like it does, it's able to still talk to the camera. It tricks the flash into thinking it's still on the camera. So you know that you've got it out here and you're creating your own shadows, creating your more dynamic images and everything, but the poor flash is none the wiser and he still thinks he's on top of the camera, so he's firing away in auto mode, just like you want him to. And this is how this works. This guy slides right on top, locks down, and you take pictures like this. So in two seconds, I keep one of these in my pockets when I shoot event. So if I really get in a bind, you know, I walk outside and all of a sudden they want pictures outside and it's dusk and there's not enough available light and I'm like, oh no, I gotta bust out my flash now, what do I do? I don't wanna nuke them by hitting it straight on. I'll take this out of my pocket and then get some neat shadow play there and almost light up like a mini studio session right outside. So people wonder how you do it, just a little quick TTL cable like that. And it gets the exact same results. If I was shooting an event like that, I would leave my flash on TTL mode so it's doing its own thinking for, it, for me. And I would just move it around however I want, and we'd be all set. Yep. A bracket. Um, occasionally, I don't right now, but I'm thinking about getting back into it, just because it's easier to, to go. Um, the question was, do I use a bracket? The brackets on the camera, a lot of the time, they come around and they allow you to basically get your flash from a, a horizontal alignment like this to a vertical one easier. They kind of rotate around. They rotate around your camera. So I'm looking into it again, but it's just an extra piece of gear. And the whole point of using these is I try to be as light as possible. Um, so at the moment, I'm not using one now. Most of the time, my flash isn't, um, I'm not shooting straight ahead anyways. So I don't get the difference when I'm, when I'm rotating over. Any other questions on uh, that? Yep. Uh, why not just use CLN? That's, one of, that's next. That's going to be one of the next triggering ones. He asked, he asked um, why don't we use CLS? CLS is a, a wireless triggering system we're going to talk about in two seconds. With pen and quote here. Yeah, OK. Um, they've got something similar now. The, the 7D was awesome for that. Um, but getting back to this, we're going to go into the nuts and bolts of an off-camera lighting setup now. So these are the things that you're going to have to put together, bare minimum, to get the light from here to our TTL cable to totally cutting the cord and being free to move our camera around however we want, within limits for a lot of them. So the first thing we're going to look at is a light stand. Let's see if we got a free one up here if I'm using them all. These right here, the ones I'm using now, are Westcott light stands. If you guys are probably all sitting on the promo for it, um, a lot of the things you'll find, like the Apollos, the Orbs, and the Umbrella kits and the things, they have designed for speed lights. They do you a service because I think for like the exact same price as the thing by itself, they come with a light stand. But if you have to buy a light stand independently, like outside of a kit, there's a couple important things. One of them is the footprint. That's basically when you spread these legs out, how much ground it's covering. That's your center of gravity. The bigger that is, the more stable your platform is going to be. So when you're buying something independently, definitely look for a big footprint. And then make sure that you've got a buddy or a sandbag or something to, to hold it down even more. Because in the end of the day, you've got, what, a $500 flash, maybe an expensive trigger, a modifier. You've got almost a grand swaying in the wind. So you definitely want to make sure that thing is locked down. So when you're looking for a light stand, Look for kits because they're really cool. I, I think I've got like probably too many Westcott stands sitting in my cases back home because I ha always buy the stuff when there's a deal on it. So I've got a bunch of the, uh, the kit stands laying around and they've worked wonders for me. Next you need an umbrella bracket. All right. These come in the kit too, which is kind of cool. The ones on the right over here that you see, these are the ones that are going to come in your speed lighting kits and your Apollo kits and things. It's this guy right here. The most important thing about any umbrella bracket you ever buy, do not buy the cheap plastic ones. You're going to go out there and you're going to see like 10 different kinds. They're going to like range from $35 to probably $8. Do not 
put a thousand dollars in the air with all this equipment, get someone to model for you, get your camera set up, get the light where you want it, and have it all hinging on an eight dollar piece of plastic. It's a bad idea. So make sure you get a metal one. The one on the right is metal. These are the ones that come with it. They're metal. They're like, they're bulletproof. They're, they're pretty solid. So uh, what these basically do for anyone who's never put together an off-camera light setup is right here, it allows you to feed the shaft of the umbrella or the Apollo through there and then use the screws to crank it down so that the umbrella stays in place. This end right here goes onto the light stand. So it connects your light stand and your umbrella. And then on top, you have different kinds of shoes. And the different kinds of shoes is what we're going to jump over to now. These guys. The mounting shoes, these prongs right here look really familiar, I hope, because they're identical almost to what's on top of your camera. These guys over here are the ones that actually come with your brackets. Or uh, yeah, come with the, uh, the umbrella bracket right there that comes in the Westcott kit. That's called a cold shoe. And the one over on the right is a hot shoe. Does anyone want to tell me why there's a difference or what the difference would be between them? Electrical connection. Electrical connection, yes. Anyone else? What would you use an electrical connection for all the way on your umbrella stand? Sing triggers. Mm-hmm. Sings and triggers, exactly. The hot shoe on the right is hot because there's a hot live connection. If you look over here, there's a PC sync port. It looks very similar because most cameras still have one, even though this technology is like ancient and should have been retired 20 years ago. It's still there. Um, but that basically allows you to have a, a, a connection or a spark sent between the little guys on the bottom of the feet on your flash, <coughs> connect to your hot shoe there, and send a trigger then through a cable that will go to a, go to a wireless trigger like a pocket wizard or something. And that allows you to re re fire them remotely. Now what we have over here is a cold shoe. Cold shoe doesn't have a trigger, doesn't have a, like a hot plate or a connection or anything. It's just meant for holding a flash. And that's cool because that's what I'm using right now to demo. And we're going to show you something a little bit about CLS, how you could trigger these wirelessly. And all we're going to need is the cold shoe that comes with your kit right off the bat. OK, these are the different ways to trigger a flash. I didn't realize there were that many options when I first started shooting. We've got our on-camera one, which is super obvious. That's the snapshot mode, but we learned how to bounce a little bit. Then we've got the TTL cable, which is pretty cool because that gets us out of the sticky situations when there's nothing to bounce off of. When I've got the TTL cable too, I forgot to mention, it still makes a hard light. It makes a shadow, but it makes a hard shadow. So you're going to want to get something to bounce it off of. This is like a, min a micro Apollo, I think is what it's called. It's basically like a baby version of our other Apollo. These are cool because you can keep them in like a back pocket. And then they just make the soft, they make it a little bit softer by diffusing it a little bit larger. So that way you don't have such a harsh light when you're using your cable out there. So definitely look into something like that, but I'm going to, I'll mention that when I go over uh, what you need for a lighting kit. The other one is uh, CLS, or Controlling the Light Commander Mode, or CTL mode. This is what, that's actually a, a proprietary term to Nikon, but Canon has finally stepped up and with the Canon 7D, gives you the ability to shoot and trigger off-camera lights without any separate equipment. They let you basically trigger lights with your pop-up flash. Anyone know you could do that? Yeah, a couple people nodding heads. The reason, uh, how, many, uh, how many Nikon shooters are in here? How many Canonistas? Okay, cool, very cool. You guys were faster to throw up the hands. I like it. Okay, the reason I started shooting Nikon, not because the autofocus and the megapixels and the videos and all that stuff, is I heard that Nikon, without having to um, get pocket wizards or anything, would let me use my pop-up flash to take this guy from here and fire him over here. I was like, I was, it's built in. Like they had a Nikon camera that had this pop-up flash doohickey where I could control this like wirelessly with no other equipment. I thought that was the coolest thing because I already had a Nikon strobe. So I was like, yeah, when I buy a digital camera, I think I'll do that. So I bought like a D200, I think it was. And that's the only reason I'm with Nikon. Sure, there's a bunch of other, of other cool things, but now Canon does the exact same thing. Uh, their new 7D allows you to do it. I think the 60D does. Uh, the T2i on, they do it. So there's a lot of models. So if you have one of those cameras, look in your manual, or if you're looking at buying a new camera, ask your camera guys about this commander mode, because it's, it's awesome. I'm going to show you why here. I'm going to set up a second setup here. And then on the 320 flash, you can trigger your camera with the flash. I didn't know that. What he said is on the, uh, the Canon 320? Yeah. On the Canon 320, he said that your flash will go off and actually control your camera, right. control your, make your camera fire. Wow. Don't tell Pocket Wizard that, because that's like their, their thing. Very cool. What I'm doing now is I'm using just the stuff we talked about. I'm using a, a light stand, an umbrella bracket with a cold shoe on top. 
So there's no hot shoe, there's no connection, there's no wires. This is about as clean as you get. And what I'm doing is, um, it doesn't really matter with the menus. If you go right outside and you go to the desk and you ask for the newer Nikon flash, it's like the D900, it's got a little dial that lets you flip it into remote mode in like a heartbeat. This one's a little bit older, so it takes me like five minutes to get through the archaic menus and find remote mode, but... Is it 800? Yeah. And I'm there. Okay, cool. So now I have this set up and I'm telling it to not act like a normal flash, but I put it in remote mode. So it's looking for a signal from a camera or another flash to fire so they can communicate. I basically said, hey, we're going to have a conversation, keep an eye out. And literally I mean an eye because if you look really, it's kind of difficult to see. There's a little porthole. I don't know why they don't put this on both sides of the camera, but this needs to be seen. Or both sides of the flash, yeah. Both sides of the flash, I mean, because this needs to be able to see your camera. This is the one limitation of this. They're communicating like this guy is still smack dab on there, but there's no cables, except the only way for them to talk is like smoke signals. Like they have to be able to see each other, like hand signals, you know? So this little eye has to all times be pointed there. That's why you want to take advantage of, you know, the ability of your flash to turn around like that, because I can do that, and I can fire from this side. So just keep in mind that one limitation. Other than that, this is pretty awesome stuff. So I'll have you uh, step back up again. Again, you're going to want to look in your camera manuals or ask one of the guys in the store for sure whether your camera does this and how to get to that setting. But it's called remote mode and master mode. So I'm, my camera is in master commander mode right here. And this is in remote mode looking for a signal. So I'm going to have you step up just a little bit for me, if you will. And I'm going to go into this menu. And rather than just fire a normal, it'll just do a, a pulse of light, I'm going into my commander mode. I'm telling my built-in flash to turn off. You can control multiple groups of flash. So now we're not just one. I can have like three or four or five out there. Yep. It, um, it depends on your camera. It's commander mode in a Nikon D700. But if you look at the back of a flash, you have to put the flash in master mode. So you can control it with a big flash on here. Like I can use another SB800 if I want, or a 900, or I can use the pop-up. So if I'm using the pop-up, it's called commander on Nikon. So what I did is I went in here, went in commander mode, turned off this guy. So he's gonna, he is going to pulse. He'll make some light just so they can talk. But he's not going to make enough light to influence my picture. And I'm going to turn my flash onto manual mode 1 8th. Let me move over just a little bit for me if you could. Perfect, right there. I'm going to take a picture. I love the beep, too. It lets you know, hey, I'm recycled. I'm ready to go. I'm ready for another picture, which is real cool. And we're going to switch over. And again, everyone cross their fingers. That Lightroom's going to play nice. I think I saw it. Cool. We're overexposed, like a whole bunch. Um, nope, I'm in manual mode now. I can use TTL. Now, if you guys look at that and you just want to eyeball and guess, how many stops overexposed do you think I am? At least two. At least two. I'm going to go with two. I'm guessing. So if I'm, I can walk over to my flash. I can turn it down. In this case, I'm using commander mode, so I can go in here. I could turn it down from here. But what if I don't want to do that? How would I adjust that for my camera? Exposure compensation. If I'm in manual mode, what would I do? ISO, we could do that. I prefer to do aperture. What controls? Flash power. Aperture. Awesome. So basically, I'm at 5.6 here. So I've got plenty of room. So rather than going all the way to my flash or going through my menu in here, I'm just going to dial my aperture. So 5.6, we'll go to 8, go to 11. We'll give another shot. See my settings down here? I didn't change anything but my f-stop. I'm getting there. I'm almost there. Go a little bit more. 13. Perfect, and I'm there. So I didn't have to go to my flash because we remember we fall back on the fact that shutter controls ambient, f-stop controls your flash output, and then if I wanted to raise or lower the whole picture, I could go back to my ISO as a global adjustment. So just keeping that in mind. What's neat though, one of the benefits about this, the way that we're triggering this now is that I can go in commander mode and I could easily just turn the power down this way too. So I'll go to like 16th, 32nd. I'll go back to 5.6 where I was. And we're going to be pretty close. So you do have multiple options, but I want to reaffirm the fact that if you know how to change your flash settings and all your power and everything from here, oh, that's way overexposed. You have to press the you gotta, yeah, you got to hit enter. There you go. If you know how to change them from here, it doesn't matter how you're triggering it. You have the control. You have the knowledge on how to change that flash. So it doesn't matter what gear or what kind of situation you're walking into. You know how to go into your camera and change it without having to learn a pack. 
So say you're assisting for someone or you're maybe borrowing some equipment to try something out or you rent something, they're like, oh man, I don't want to have to deal with the menu on that expensive battery pack. You know how to change your f-stop to get the exact result or your shutter speed for the exact result. So that's why that's the foundation you definitely want to build when you're learning off camera lighting. That's not the cycle times or the, the battery capacity in the flash. Exactly, yeah. That's why a lot of times I'll shoot everything manual so I can keep it down to 1 8th or 1 16th rather than TTL where it'll fire as much as it wants. Or even dialing up the uh, aperture rather than just dropping the power. Yes, exactly. So the, yeah, he, what he mentioned was if, you, um, if you're not concerned with recycle time. So if I have like this aperture of f13, I need a, that's a small hole in my aperture, so I need a lot more light coming out. Yeah. He was saying the possibility of maybe instead of going to that, maybe go to like 2.8 or f4. So the hole in your aperture is larger, lets more light in. My flash doesn't have to work as hard to fit that light in there to make the exposure. So yeah, it's a dance. I mean, for whatever your output is, if maybe we're, we're worried about recycle time, we can stop down. Or if we're worried about uh, maybe getting a lot in focus, we can go up to f13. But knowing how to make that balance and still get the exposure, using the criteria we want for that creative result. You were talking about when you were doing surfing or whatever outside, and I'm interested in lighting outside. Mm -hmm. Are you going to cover that a little bit? Yes, we're definitely going to get to that. Yep. All right, very cool. Now let's look over here. Remember, shutter speed controls our ambient, so I'm going to take a picture. I'll have you move over just a little bit for me. Beautiful right there. I'll back that up some. All right, really slow shutter speed here. I'm down like one fifth of a second. Thank goodness I have a tripod on this. But this is basically I just wanted to show you all that light that's coming in behind her. If we remember what controls app or what controls our ambient exposure? Shutter, shutter speed. So instead of going out there and telling the guys to turn down the shop lights, which isn't possible in this sense, but if I wanted to, or maybe going out and then telling them to turn down the sun because it's too bright, instead because I know that shutter speed controls my ambient exposure, I can just dial up my shutter speed and I'm going to kill all that ambient light and I'm still going to get the same flash exposure. So see the difference between the two shots? All right. So yeah, if you guys walk away with this and you know your aperture and your shutter speed and how they work with flash in your sleep, I did my job. That's awesome. All right, if you want to take a seat again, we're going to switch over. All right, so the next step we're going to be looking at is uh, infrared. This is kind of basically the next step along the evolution. If, uh huh? The cable for convenience. So if I have the cable, I can just pull it out. I know I'm going to get a trigger every single time, yet I still have the control to keep it off camera. When I go wireless here, if I'm out in bright sunlight, it might not be 100% reliable because the sun is going to compete with that little flash. Okay. And you use the wireless more on the stand than you would Exactly. Around. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the, the cord is for event work. This is for if I have a little more time. And then I'm going to go into stuff like the infrared and then the radio triggers, and those are what I use constantly. Those are my main workhorses. And with this obviously you can go their way. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Huh? So let's say the AF assist with the cord is the big advantage also. Absolutely, yes. What he mentioned was the autofocus assist on the cord. Some of the cords you get have a little autofocus infrared beam that comes out and helps you get focus in low light, which is a lifesaver sometimes. What I meant was on the flash, actually. The flash uh, AF assist light. Yes. Yep, okay. Uh, autofocus on the flash. Some of the flashes, especially the SB800, have a little red autofocus beam that comes out, helps you grab focus when it's on camera. If you use the TTL cable, like I, like I showed on the screen, that also has one. That's one of their big features, is they have the infrared so you don't lose that assistant focus. When you go totally wireless like that, that shuts down. So after the fact, we're not going to have that advantage. What's the difference between the price between the TTL and the remote? And the remote? Yeah. This TTL is totally free. So I mean, if you have the flash, you can do this with your camera right off the bat. If this, you wanted to go up to this route, these are about 200 bucks, I think, for the SU-800s. And I'm going to explain what these are. These basically take this little pulse of light and the radio signal that communicate and tell it to fire, and it's like a super powerful TV remote. So it, it, has, it still needs line of sight, but it'll shoot through like a Westcott Apollo or an umbrella, so you get that. And you don't need a trigger on every end, it's just a transmitter, and then your flashes see it. Was that the question? And it works OK with uh, outside? I mean, yes. Any kind of line of sight stuff is going to be difficult in bright sun. Because remember, this little light or that little beam of infrared is competing with direct sunlight, which is pretty tough, which is why I'm going to use what I'm going to show you next, radio triggers most of the time outdoors. Did that answer the question, though? Yeah. Yep. OK, cool. Yeah, so cost-wise, as we're scaling up, if it's on camera, it's free. If you're using the cable, it's anywhere between $20 to $90. If we're using 
the built-in commander mode, again, it's free. All you have to do is have the camera and the flash. What we're going to now is now we're adding devices to help us communicate better, help us get a better, stronger, more reliable wireless trigger. This right here is the Canon version, the Nikon version. These, like I said, basically take this little infrared pulse out and then upscale it to like a super-powered TV remote. So it's still line of sight. I mean, if your dog's in front of your receiver, it's probably not going to be able to change the channel. But if like a bed skirt or like, you know, part of your dresser table or someone's walking by or like your Xbox game falls over it, you know, you might still be able to change the channel. So I mean, it works to a point. It works well enough that you can have a Westcott Apollo or something like that and trigger it with this. But if you're in bright, bright daylight, I would recommend going on to the next step, which is basically uh, wireless control, which is going to be radio waves, which are going to be stuff like the Pocket Wizard. Maybe I did break PowerPoint. There we go. And back. So this goes back to what we mentioned earlier. These are the hot shoes we were talking about. What's great about them is they are able to communicate a signal. And what we're using is the pocket wizards here. Now this is going to get more expensive because now that we're in the triggers and we're outside of a Nikon or Canon product, we need to have a, a product for every step of the way. So I need, a, I need a trigger, whether it's a pocket wizard or you walk out the door and there's going to be like 10 different kinds. You know, Put that on there to send a signal. Put another one here to receive a signal and then the cable to relay it, and then the hot shoe to touch the bottom of your flash to tell it to fire. So it becomes a little more complicated. I say it's reliable, but you have more moving parts to break now. So it, again, there's a trade-off in everything you do with photography, especially when it comes to the gear. So this is uh, like your standard setup. I will say when you're going out there, how many people are using Pocket Wizards now? Got a small handful? When you go out, what's neat is so many people are interested in realizing how far you can push these small flashes that the market has exploded. There's all kinds of different trigger manufacturers out there now. Um, like I said, price points from $20 to $200. When you're going out and you're going ahead and looking and shopping around, it's the same mindset as when you look for a lens. If you spend good money up front, that lens is going to last you your entire career. If you buy into a system like Pocket Wizard or something like that, these guys I bought like five years ago, I can walk downstairs to the guys selling the Pro Photo gear and fire their flashes today with these. So when you think about that, it's a little bit more money, but you're buying into like a, a legacy product that's kind of ingrained in a bunch of different equipment, and it's a whole system that you're buying into. So keep that in mind. Same thing with lenses, though. If, you're, if you save up a couple extra bucks, you can use the same lenses forever, which is really cool. And they keep their value. Yeah, and they keep their value. They're like the only thing that doesn't depreciate in this world, which is really cool. So that's, um, this is how I would go, and this is probably our evolutionary step back in flash triggering. There was this long time here where we had on camera, we had cable stuff. Canon gave us, or Canon and Nikon gave us a little bit of freedom with this whole communication thing, but it was line of sight, so bright days or far away, like we'd lose our signal. Then Pocket Wizard came around, they're like, hey, we got a fix, but everything's back to manual mode. We know how to do that, so we're not worried about it. But Pocket Wizard recently came out with some technology called their new units, which is their Flex TT5 and Flex or Mini TT1. These brought it back home. This is like, we hit that next level of evolution, because these, again, make your flash think it's back on top of the camera. So you get all of the functions that your flash has on top of the camera, except you get it super far away. So this is what I have set up over here and I've been using for demos. It's basically the same way. It's got a hot shoe built into the top to communicate the signal, so the flash goes right onto the trigger. And then this guy has a little foot that sits on a cold shoe to hold it there on my umbrella bracket. And then it's got the little antenna that pops out. And it talks to the guy on top of my camera and I can fire it. And again, it makes it think that it's on a TTL cable or right here. So it thinks for itself, it goes TTL mode, you can do all the other advanced features you get out of your speed light, you can do them all, and you can throw this down a well, behind a wall, wherever you want, so you don't need line of sight anymore. They don't have to see each other. You can put them, hide them, get creative with them. You can put them like I did in the video game shoot. You can hide them in someone's video machine and shoot back out. I mean, it really unlocks all the creativity. So which one is better, Flex TT5 or, or Plus 2? Um, these guys, the Flex TT5, for sure. Because the Plus 2, which is this guy, is going to work like... Two TT, TT5 rather than uh, uh, Flex 1. Oh, yes, I'll, I'll definitely explain that. The question was, um, which is better, this guy or this guy? Mm -hmm. Depends what you're using it for. If you're using speed lights, these guys unlock the full potential of a speed light, just like it was on your camera. These guys right here are all you need to fire most studio strobes and things like that because all you need is something to send a fire signal. That's it. So if you want, if you're using speed lights, like we're talking about in this class and getting the most out of them, this is definitely the way to go. And I guess the other question was, so which one do you need? 
That's cool. They're good both for strobes and flashes, right? Yes. What's cool is they're backwards compatible. So, we lost our trigger here. They'll work all the way with the, the flashers or the, the strobes and stuff for the, the plus twos that I bought five years ago will work with these guys. So they work together. So you have the channel marker here. If I keep them on channel one through four, I can put these, channel one, two, and you can set more with uh, the USB cable you plug in. They'll fire off of each other. So it's uh, backwards compatible. So all the flashers that I have, I don't have to throw away. I mean, they can be used both uh, with strobes and with camera flashes. Absolutely, okay. yep. The question was, can they be used with both strobes and camera flashes? Yes. Monolights. Monolights, yep. Like studio strobes and, and bigger lights. Uh, both of them. On the back of these, they have a little 1 8 uh, inch jack, just like on the top of this. It looks like that guy. And you can get an adapter to go into a bigger one. So yeah, what's great about this is one day if you decide, hey, maybe I want to buy studio strobes, these flashes will do the job, which is really cool. So they're definitely worth it. All right, we've got that. All right, now to modifiers. Any other questions with triggers? Yeah. Maximum distance. Maximum distance? I think um, these guys say like a couple hundred feet, and these guys were once saying they could go 1,600 feet. I tried it once. I, sat, I was on top of a 12-story building and had an assistant go like three blocks away, and I could see the light. So I mean, those guys, they go. Uh, could you like, use them to go higher than your camera's sync speed? Yes. The question was, can you use them to go higher than your camera's native sync speed? Yes. It's called a high-speed sync technology. It bases itself off of the FP mode that's already built into your speed light. That's a whole other advanced workshop we could spend hours talking about. But yes, when you go this route, then as your, your knowledge of your speed lights gets more advanced and you look into high speed sync and rear curtain sync and all that kind of cool stuff, these guys allow you to take advantage of all that. So these are almost future proof. Like I said, these make your flash think it's on the camera. So if your flash can do it here, it can do it now wirelessly and not have to see the camera. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. The four stories, right? So it's going through the floor and everything to get down there. Yeah. It, it drives you batty if you're working in like a rented studio with multiple floors. It's like you have to phone down to find out who's on what channel because people will start firing your packs as they start shooting in the other studios. So this right here has four channels. They make another model called the Multimax that has 32 channels. And these guys can do a full 32 channels as well. You basically have to plug them into the computer and um, go through a little utility. Can those fire multiple flashes? Just yeah. Flashes? You know what? Before I owned a bunch of these, I was kind of on the fence. Because I mean, they're, at, they're still, they're, at the time, they were like 200 bucks a pop or something like that. I'm like, ah, am I really need it? Can I just use like my pop-up flash and call it a day? So I only bought two of them. And I, had, um, I, went to po or I went to Radio Shack and got a splitter, like a three-way like, headphone splitter almost, and basically ran three different strobes off of one plus two. So I mean, I can run a whole setup. I still travel with splitters and extra cable in case my triggers die, and I'll just split off the signal. So yeah, great question. The question was, can you run multiple flashes off these? Yes. If you can get a line out and split, you can do it. To keep in mind, though, when you're using triggers like this, notice there's only one ring here. You need to use a mono cable. You can't walk into an electronics store and get a stereo cable. It'll muddle the, muddle the signal that goes through the line and won't consistently fire your flash. Found that the hard way. I bought like 10 cables, couldn't figure out why, which ones didn't work. You need a mono cable. So when you're using speed lights and triggers, pocket wizards, whatever other brands out there, make sure you're using a mono cable. So a mono splitter, mono extension cables, and mono plugs. And, yep. Are you going to cover high speed sync? Not in this one, no. That's definitely an advanced class. I do have a course on that, but not today. Cool. So if you guys are all comfortable um, controlling our light, knowing how to, to knock down or raise up our ambient, how to adjust our flash power by using our f-stop instead of running over to our flash every two minutes, because nothing, nothing takes away all that confidence that you've built up in your subject and your subject has in you than running to your flash 20 times to change the power. Like, I tell you what, your client starts to look like, you, like you're a nut, and the person in front of the camera is like, does this guy know what he's doing? He's run over to his flash 20 times already today. So uh, being able to know how to adjust your ambient and your flash power, just playing with settings in your camera is, is massive. So I'm going to move on to modifiers now, which is fun. Um, if I had one modifier, just one, I can get away with one. I can shoot most jobs with one. What do you guys think it would be? An Apollo 28? I wish. You know, if I could, if I could shoot everything with a 28, I'd be a happy man. I shoot most of my stuff with an Apollo. An umbrella? Yeah. yeah. 
More particularly, a, a reversible umbrella like this. It's the guy I've got set up over there. It's a 60 inch umbrella and the reason I went with 60 inch is because I'll show you how to make a 60 inch act like a 30 or a 43 inch, a 23 inch. I mean, I can make a big umbrella go small. I can't make a small umbrella act big. Can't do that. Uh, so what I would do if I had only one modifier for the rest of my life, it would definitely be this guy, which is right over there. And by reversible or removable cover, basically it looks like it does. I'm using it as a bounce umbrella, but if I take off the black cover, it becomes a shoot through umbrella. So it's like two umbrellas in one. There we go. And if I had to build on top of that a little bit really quickly before I break down the umbrella, I would get a reflector. I'd get a bounce card or something like this. So if I have my camera on a cable, I would get like a little uh, micro guy. So I've got something when I'm on a TTL cable to soften it a little bit like I mentioned, and then the Apollo 28. Because that's by far my, it was my favorite. My favorite now is the orb, because I like the round catch light. But yeah. So going back to this, if Dave, I could have you help me out, I'm going to show you a couple different ways to use your umbrella. Um, how many ways do you think there are to use an umbrella? There's some obvious ones and not so obvious. Anyone? Shoot through. Oh, bounce. Yep. Anyone else? There's more, I swear. Use as, a, as a flag. As a flag? Yes, I keep getting that. That's perfect. You can use a flag. Uh, was mentioned. You can use the umbrella as a flag. Basically, you can set it up to stop light from spilling onto something. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. um, we're gonna do a. Uh, we've already seen the bounce, you guys. So let's do a, a poor man's softbox. I'll show you how to make this act like an orb or an Apollo. Yep. Stay dry. Stay dry. Yes, that's an awesome one. I'm gonna need that this afternoon. I didn't bring an umbrella other than my photo ones. So yeah, stay dry. For real. Don't take one of yours. <laughs> so I'll have you stand right over there if you could for me. To stay dry, well, there's a couple more. I'll show you. This is my favorite one. Uh, we've talked about the Apollo. For you guys not familiar, if you look in the catalogs that were on, on your seat, the Apollo is the 28-inch softbox. It's like the medium-sized one. And I like it because it's super soft light because you bounce light in the back, so it spreads out nice and even. So we take a small light source, and then we've got it 28 inches already. And then we put it through a nice like diffusion panel in the front so we've got a light that goes from small to larger to like buttery smooth when it comes out. So it's awesome light. How often do you break your tips? Do I break the tips? Yeah. I've never broken a tip. Uh, I've broken the ribs, but not the tip. How often? Um, I've gone through two now. I beat them up. Like I said, if I didn't mention it earlier, I fly with this stuff. Like the people at the TSA look at me funny because none of my umbrellas have handles. And I actually have people say, hey, your umbrella's broken. Do you even want to bring it? Yeah, just bring it. Like, I mean, I think I came over with a 60 inch uh, tiny one. I don't know if it's over here. It's the little collapsible travel one. It's a 43 inch umbrella that breaks down like tiny, like a double fold. Um, an Apollo and an orb. I flew with all of those, cinched them together, tied them to my bag, and they just thought I was like over prepared to go to New York for the rain this week. <laughs> yeah, it was hilarious. Um, I almost tried to go on with the parabolic. So my goal is before the end of the year to fly with this guy. That's it. Collapsible, <laughs> like that, and then it's got a. Can it be used with any chrome monolites, like 7-inch shaft? Um, I don't know if they tapered it enough for that. I think it has a 7-inch tape. Uh, yeah, I think they tapered it, yeah. The question was, can it be used with Ellen Chrome? Ellen Chrome makes great lights, but um, they want you to buy their stuff, understandably. So they made a non-universal hole in their umbrella bracket for you to put stuff through. The standard is 8 millimeters. They made a 7 millimeter, so you can only buy, buy Ellen Chrome umbrellas. The smaller hole is right where the reflector is. Okay. The tilter bracket should have another umbrella hole in it. Wherever it doesn't, you can put it on a bracket that does. We have a workaround. And, and Ellen Chrome is a, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you still? <laughs> they, they, they want to keep their stuff proprietary, so they make a smaller Dave's, hole. Dave's more blunt than, than I am. We'll, uh, yeah, they we'll censor him. Yeah, over the past few decades. Yeah, okay. customers that way. So first we've got an umbrella. You guys know what the bounce umbrella looks like? It's a great way to light a group. But what it does is basically takes a light, spreads it out, makes it large, large and soft, but we have minimal, minimal control. What I was mentioning about the Apollo is I dig it because it's a directional light. Rather than when I have light like this, it's flying everywhere, like 140 degrees or something like that. I mean, it's flying out the sides, the front. I mean, it's a great way to get a lot of spread. But when I take a picture, which we will here. Oh, we need to find my trigger, my receiver somewhere. Somewhere. What are you using? Um, the small ones. That's you lost them. Yeah, see, now they're making wireless triggers so small I lost them. But anyways, what you would do is take something like this, which is spreading light all over the place, which isn't necessarily what we want in this instance, and you break it down, and I call this the poor man's softbox. 
because all of a sudden we've broken it down and instead of flying all over the place, it's more directional. See how we've collapsed it down all of a sudden? And this looks a lot more like the dimensions and the depth of maybe our orb, which is meant to only throw light in one direction, which is really cool. And I'm going to show you guys why uh, CLS is so cool because, Dave, if you want to grab that. There we go. I misplaced one of my triggers, so rather than go in my bag and get a second one, I'll show you really quick how we can just slap this guy in remote mode, and we can do the rest of the demo without any triggers. That's a scary thought. So there we go. Put our camera in remote mode. Exit it out. There we go. And if anyone's trying to mess with me and they've got a Nikon camera, I'm on channel 3, group B. So if you guys want to jump on that same channel. Cool. So let me check my settings. 255.6. That all sounds good. I'm going to go back here into commander mode. And we're going to go 130 second power. Just it's an arbitrary number just to see where we're at. Perfect. And then we're going to switch this guy over. Yep. And, um, yep if you want to open that up, I've got more. Uh, perfect. I got way too many pocket wizards for that reason, because I always lose things or break things. Perfect. There we go. We guessed a good number, I think, because we were kind of almost balanced from our last one. So we've got that. So it's a lot more dramatic. Now compare this with our directional light, so we're letting less of it spill in the background with this guy. There you go. Perfect. Now this is probably one of the most overlooked ways to use an umbrella because people are like, eh, I'll just buy a softbox. Well, if you even have one laying around, then you've got to set it up, change it out. Your light's never in the same place. You know, your settings are going to be a little bit off because it's going through that. So there we go. Did it work over? Perfect. Oh, it didn't go through. Let's fire one more time. Ready? <coughs> this is it. Oh, that was it. OK, cool. All right, cool. So if we go back to, see how dark our background is? See how right there, that's with it all the way open, and that's with it collapsed down a little bit. So this is great because it allows us to go from a lot of spill over here. I'm going to bring this more over because I think she's like half lit. I'm not liking how I'm not getting light in her eyes there. So I'll bring it over here. There we go. If you're thinking about catch lights, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Beautiful. Hold that. Catch lights, um, the reason I like the orb over the Apollo or the umbrella one day over like a softbox the next is because I shoot outdoors a lot and I love the catch lights. And if you look really closely in the eyes, you'll notice that the round catch lights mimic the sun, mimic like how we're normally used to seeing people's eyes. Like if you look in each other's eyes, you're all going to have round catch lights in there. What's neat about a softbox is the softbox makes you think that it's actually, um, it's actually uh, like a window light. It's kind of why they made it. So if you have a square softbox and a square catch light outdoors, to me it always kind of looked funky because I was like, why is there this window light and this girl standing out in the field? You know, my, my, The eyes are telling me one thing and the lighting's telling me the other thing. So that's another reason why I mix between the two, and I love an umbrella. So there we go. Now that my exposure is actually correct, we can actually see it a little better on the screens. So that's with it all the way open, but you know, this is nothing new to you guys, how to, uh, how to set up a standard umbrella. So I'll break it down a little bit, tilt it over, and I'll have you turn your face towards the light just a little bit for me. And bring your eyes back to me. Beautiful. Awesome. And this is just going to get us a little more control. Now, if I wanted to be uh, to really make my background grow dark, I'll show you something else we can do by moving her away. It's using the inverse square law. But we're kind of cramped quarters here, so I'm just going to switch this around and show you a shoot through umbrella, which you guys are nodding like, yeah, I know what a shoot through umbrella is. I've used it before. But Dave, let's break this guy down and switch it around. I'm only going to use half of a shoot through umbrella. And I'll show you guys why. This is probably the second way people uh, are the second most overlooked way to use your umbrella. So bring this back over here. It's kind of like the splash zone sitting, out the, sitting up front here. Sorry about that. All right, I'll slide you over just, uh, actually, that's perfect right there. Yep. Turn that over. Now what's beautiful, remember I said about um, a shoot through umbrellas, you can get it a lot closer to your model. Like if I wanted her that close on the other end, she'd have the stick poking her in the eye. But this way I can almost get it right there, right outside of the frame and bring it in. I'm going to take the camera off here because I need to get a vertical shot to show you the difference in these two. So there we go. Perfect. 
Awesome. Now when this comes up, I want to show you why I only left part of the thing on here. Can anyone guess? The fall off, the flag it, exactly. So if you look down at her lower body, there's not a lot of light going down on the rest of her clothes because why light the rest of her clothes? It's a portrait. The important thing is seeing her eyes and seeing her smile and that kind of stuff. So compare that, if we take this eye all the way off, how most people just, and not, this isn't wrong either, but most people just go and use a shoot through umbrella like this and throw light everywhere. That's one of the good things of an umbrella is it spreads light all over the place. But this guy right here without a baffle is like a light grenade, watch. You're going to be as lit as she is, and you're going to be a little bit less lit, but all of you guys are going to be lit. Like, I could take a picture of the room, and you're all going to be lighting up. Beautiful. All right. Do you want to uh, you kill that one? Let's turn that one off. Beautiful. Now see how lit her hands are, and see how all you guys are lit too? I'm going to take one more of those, because we had a little bit of a loose fire. Beautiful. So this is one of the downfalls of an umbrella and why I would use the poor man's softbox like I showed you, because he's getting as much light as she is. It's not necessarily what you want, but if I had it like I did earlier, where it was broken down, I have a directional light, just like a softbox, going in only one direction, which is kind of cool. Now if we want to go back to... Oh, the clicker seems to be skipping over. And you want to compare these, there's a lot that we flagged off the light, which basically means we blocked the light with the bottom from falling down there. And if you look at this picture, look how distracting her right hand is, because her right hand is getting just as much light as her face is. So that's why if you're shooting a portrait, portrait photographers like a hot spot on the face and then less light on everything else, because it forces the viewer, because we look at the brightest thing in a picture right away, it forces the viewer to go to our, the most important part of our subject, which is definitely the eyes and the face. So that's why if you're shooting portraits, I would I'd try something like this. If you don't have something to, or someone to stand there with a reflector and flag that light off, I would just leave half my baffle on and give that a shot. So there's a couple different ways. That's just four different ways. But like we mentioned, there's, there's a couple other two to, uh, to put a, an umbrella to use. But if I was stuck with just one modifier and it had to be, if it had to be just one modifier for like the rest of my career, it would definitely be an umbrella. Because I can fake a soft box if I need to. I can get soft, even light for lighting a group portrait. I can use a half baffled light right here so that it falls off a little bit faster and I can get an isolated portrait light there and I can bounce it back around and get a nice broad even spread of light. Mm -hmm. Yep. How many would you need for, Dep for 10? Ideally, I would, I would put two lights at 45 degrees with bounce umbrellas because the bounce umbrella is going to spread everywhere but it, like we're doing here, it's shooting this way and that way so we're wasting light. When you do a bounce umbrella, it's only going to be going that one direction. All over that one direction. Yes, so I turn it around so it's bouncing in and then lighting back to my group. Exactly. Yep. Same power, same height? Same, yeah, ideally, yeah. Because I just want to get a flat, even light. If it was just a group portrait, I wasn't doing like something creative like that, I'd want to make sure everyone's lit. That's the most important thing. What if you don't have two umbrellas? If you don't have two, if you just have one? I would bring it on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right out the door. <laughs> I would bring it on camera access again, but I would do a flat lighting like we did uh, with the with the girl's portrait with the blue eyes. So I would bring it right here and fly it up really high, and I would make it as big as possible and turn it up all the way. Because if I have it flying here, it's going to evenly light my front row and slowly fall off to the outskirts. Where if I put it on one side or the other. The guys at the end of the row aren't going to be anywhere nearly as evenly lit as the people over on this side. So I bring it right over here, front and center, and what I would do is I would pull it back as much as possible. I'm, I can explain a little bit of the inverse square law in another, uh, another class, but I'll touch on it here. It just basically means that light falls off three times as quickly when you double the distance. So what that means is if I pull my light way back, it's going to fall off really quickly here. So this person will be like, you know, maybe 5.6, or I'm sorry, F8. This one will be 5.6. This one will be 2.8. And then as you get farther away from your light, you just think of it like depth of field. There's more area that's in focus the more depth of field you have. And then with the more area, it's kind of like light depth of field, the more even exposure area you have. So I would move them far away. Or if I bring it close and put the light here, she's going to be really hot, and very quickly it's going to fall off. But if I move her away from the light and no one's here, no one's overexposed, and then it slowly fades to a more gradual fall off. So I would move it far away, on camera access, and up high. Would you ever use that to bounce like off you like with the regular flash, like off the ceiling or off the wall? That, the umbrella? The umbrella? Yeah. 
Uh, I use it to bounce onto backgrounds, white backgrounds, when I want to make them white, because I need to take a small light source and wide it out to get a wash of white on a white background. Yeah. Um, I haven't for a ceiling, though, no. Mm -hmm. I normally, when I bounce off a ceiling, I keep the flash zoomed in, so I get the most amount of juice going in the direction I want, and then it disperses when it bounces back down. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Cool. Let's move on. Back up, cool. All right, now we're to light placement. This one's a tough one. Now that we actually figured out the kind of quality of light we want, we figured out how to use an umbrella to get it. If you skip down a little bit, we talked a little bit about catch lights. Why I would like to use a round light because it mimics the sun outdoors, as opposed to using a soft box which looks more like a window, which is really appropriate indoors. Because if you see a square catch light and someone's indoors, they're like, man, that must be a beautiful window in that house that they're standing by. So that's kind of the thought process they want you to, uh, to have with that. But when we talk about uh, height, that ties in really well with where our catch lights are. Most of the time when we're lighting a subject, we don't want it to be overly, overly obvious that we're lighting them. So if we put the light where we naturally find it above the person, you know, it's going to be a, a more pleasing image to the eye. So have you ever seen like the Halloween um, like campfire stories and stuff where they would sit around the campfire and talk like this? It's not a flattering way to light anybody. Okay? Especially if it's a portrait or something like that, they will, you're never going to be able to photograph those people again and chances are you probably won't get paid if you were charging. So keep the light high, over the eye level. Because if we're pretending we're a sun or a high window casting light, light source isn't coming from down here, usually. I don't know, depending on where you're standing in the world. So keep it high. And the distance to the background is super, super important. Let's go with the uh, Apollo for this one, Dave. The orb? Mm-hmm. Um, nope, just uh, the 28-inch Apollo. Oh, I found the triggers. Awesome. Well, I got another one. I'm going to put it away before you. One definite reason you would look into buying a new flash, especially the SB900, so much faster to get from remote mode to normal mode. There we go. All right, A, one, there we go, cool. All right, Dave, don't look into the light. All right, there we go. Perfect. That's something you definitely um, don't want to do to someone bigger than you, but if you have like a new assistant that you're bringing in or whatever, you, you got to pop off a light in their face every now and then. Dave's from New York and could probably take me if he wanted to, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to, I'm not gonna try to flash him. No, you guys from Detroit, pretty rough. You just moved Yeah, I'm, I'm still a thin-blooded Florida kid. From Florida. Yeah. Yeah, I'm from Florida. Wimps. <clears throat> All right, so we'll keep that guy off. All right, what I'm doing now is the reason I'm going to a softbox is because what I want to show you is going to involve, I'm going to need a lot more light control to be able to pull it off. So having a softbox, again, I've mentioned a couple times, it's a very directional light. So instead of an umbrella blasting all over the place, I'm selecting this because it's only sending light in the direction I want. And some people have mentioned feathering. Feathering, I'm basically going to use these lips here on the front to feather off the edge of my light off the background. So the first thing people do a lot of the times when they have a softbox or an umbrella and they're going to take a portrait, they have their background, two feet up they stick their model, two feet more up they stick their light and they call it a day. They turn it on, turn it off, they wonder why they have harsh shadows, they wonder why they can't control their background and it's because they don't understand hard and soft light for one thing and, and what I'm going to show you right now. Which is basically, we know that if the light distance between our subject stays the same, that exposure is going to be the same, but if we pull it off, the light's going to fall off very quickly. So if I bring the light in close to my model and close to the background like most people would normally do, they normally blast it off like this. Take a quick sample shot. Can you four finger swipe over to uh, Lightroom? Maybe Dave's got the magic touch and can make it work. No? <laughs> my flash fire? Fire that time. Oh, 
Oh, Lightroom froze up. There we go. All right. Flash is firing. We're golden there. Let's get a decent exposure, maybe. Cool. All right, here we go. So this is how normal people would set it up. They'd have their background, their model, their light. They would go ahead and take a shot, and they would call it a day. Be like, OK, cool. And if they had any problems, they wouldn't even know where to begin troubleshooting. So that's not a bad portrait. It helps because I've got a good model and really soft light. So if I wanted that background to go away a little bit more, all I have to do is pull her off the background. But we don't want to change a lot of variables. Because the problem is when you change everything and you don't get the result you want, what do you go back and then change again? So we're going to change one thing at a time so that we know how to troubleshoot. So rather than moving our model and our light and everything all over the place, I'm going to have you remember how far you are from the light and then walk up with me, OK? Perfect, right there. All right, turn your face towards light just a little bit. Beautiful eyes to me, excellent. Awesome. So now what we did is we kept her the same distance. And remember, light falls off faster the closer it is to our light source. So the, her light isn't going to change. But since we moved the background so far away, we very quickly went to black. And all we did was move our model up like three or four feet. So if you look back over, that's where people start. And they wonder why they have harsh shadows and backgrounds that are distracting. If we know what we're doing, we can very quickly, in two seconds, get the same shot. We didn't change anything but our distance from the background. Camera settings didn't change. Modifiers didn't change. Model didn't change. Flash output didn't change. Nothing but that. So that's definitely good to keep in mind when you're talking about backgrounds. If you want your background to disappear, keep your light the same distance to your model, but move the whole setup away from the background. Same thing if you want to bring it in. If you're stuck in an area like that, and you're getting the shadows you don't want, and there's not enough room to back up, get a bigger light modifier. Because remember, that shadow gets really soft and almost disappears if our light gets soft enough, too. So that's a definitely a way to overcome that. Any other questions? No? All right. The next thing we're definitely going to want to go into is using all of your light. This is another common mistake. And these are all things that I kind of blundered through. And I wish I would have done more education and stuff rather than trial and error. But um, using the entire light, most people get these, these big, soft, beautiful light modifiers and don't end up using the whole thing. I'm going to have you step around right here, if you could, for me, uh, right up front and center. Yep. What they do is they have, the, they have their soft box here, and they place their model smack dab in the middle of it. Or the same thing with an umbrella. You think if you have this, this light, you need to put her smack dab in the center, and that's going to get you the best light output. It's not always true. So if I have this light hitting her, and I'll have you look up straight down the aisle, we're going to pretend I'll have you square up and everything. So we're going to pretend Dave's the photographer. So our camera's down there. We've got her smack dab in the middle of this light. That's our camera. We're using half of our light. Only half of our light is spilling onto the front of her face. I'm saying we're only using half of it because we're still using the other half, of course, but it's on the back side of her head. So that's not going to do us a lot of good with a camera until we get like the cool Lycos Generation 5 where we can take all the focus and you know, all the shots all over the place. But for now, we're wasting half of our light. So if I wanted to make a soft shot and take advantage, because remember, we've got a small flash with only so much output, so we want to take advantage of all of it, I would just move this up a half a foot so she's sitting on the back side of the softbox now. And all of a sudden, we're using 90% of the light to sweep around the front of her face. A lot more light, a lot more soft light, because our light got bigger. Here, she was only a 14-inch softbox. Now, she's a 28-inch softbox. See the difference? So that's definitely using all of the light. Now, to really, uh, to really go to the opposite end of the spectrum, I'm going to show you how we can use a very little amount of the light to get a really high-impact portrait. So I'll have you step over this way, if you could. And then look straight ahead at the light. Again, this works best with a soft box because you have control because you have a really directional light. So oops, I think I, I, think I uh, broke PowerPoint again. Give that a second to catch up. I'll actually do the demos live here really quick, too. What we're going to do is, now we showed you how to use all of the light. So if you buy a 28-inch softbox, you're not walking around through life only using 14 inches of it and feeling like a chump because you left half of it on the table. Definitely want to use all of your tool. So you're going to step her in front of here. We're going to start off, like we said, might be incorrect, right in the middle of the softbox. So I'll have you square shoulders and everything there. And I'm going to show you what this profile portrait will look like. Oh, we came back alive. OK, cool. The profile is going to look like this. 
basically what we're doing is we're, uh, we're using 14 inches of our 28 inch softbox on the front side of her face that you see and because I have her dramatically facing profile we're using the other on the back. So right now we've got a 14 inch softbox which is great because I'm, in this case I'm not interested in using all of it, I'm interested in using a very small amount to sculpt a picture. So I'll have you sidestep about two feet this way if you could, a little bit more. There we go. So if I'm shooting the picture here, previously if I was shooting it from this direction, I'm now letting the whole softbox wrap around the front of her face, I'm doing the inverse. I have her in front of the softbox and now I can only see about six inches of the softbox coming around and lighting up her face. So we have a smaller light source, which means it became harder, which means our transfer from the highlight to the shadow became more pronounced. So I have you slide step just a little bit for me. Perfect right there. See what's happening? Slide step just a little bit more. That's the final result. Actually, you'd probably be about here. I'm gonna take a shot to see if we can get that exact same thing. So I'll have you step up a little bit more. And there you go, full profile, excellent. So that's what we're gonna be looking at. So in this case, if I'm standing here and I'm her, I can see about like two inches of that softbox. That's a very hard light. But basically, we know now how to use the smallest amount of our softbox for a high impact portrait versus using all 28 inches of our softbox to wrap around and get a really soft shot. So going into this, we can be a lot more creative with our one light without changing any settings. We just walked our model up. The thing is really cool though, if we actually did this for a client, like we walked in and put our model this far in front of a softbox, they probably think we were nuts. They might drum us right out of the studio. So don't open up with this, but after you get the shot, go back and do something neat like this and just offer a couple different looks. Along that same vein though, when you get something set up, before you uh, mess with your lights or change any settings or move your, uh, move your light sources around and things, I really want you to uh, get creative not with your lighting setups then, but your angle of shooting. So I'll have you uh, take a seat if you'd like right there. I want to show you an example of that, which is this guy right here. If you look on the left, the photo on the left is flat lighting. That's what we showed you before. It's actually this picture. This was taken last night. Uh, there, are my, there are my buddies right there with the Apollo, the, uh, the Apollo Orb. And what I did is I asked the model to freeze and not move. This is another instance of getting the most out of a setup and a bunch of settings without having to change anything but getting drastically different photos. So I took one picture straight on. I basically stood right under the, right under the Apollo and took a picture straight on and got that flat light because I wanted to see all the details and everything. I didn't want a lot of shadow and drama. And then I moved over against the wall. Just move me. If you look, she's got the exact same pose, the exact same hand face, everything. Literally, two seconds later, I scooted around the side and shot down. And all of a sudden, we've got really hard side light and almost rim lighting. So we have flat lighting and then rim lighting. We didn't change anything but my position. So those two things show you that all you have to do is move your model a little bit or move yourself a little bit. And you can get like 10 different looks out of one setup. And then we already know how to troubleshoot it if we're not there yet. So once you build something, definitely push your creativity to, move, to use as much as possible of it. Yep. And you were around the same distance or you were, uh, once you get to the side of the, of the model? I mean, oh yeah. The, the, about the same distance? Like um, kind of like. I guess I understand. The question is, was I the same distance for each shot? I wasn't. I think these are probably different focal lengths too. The neat thing about it is though, uh, my distance to the model didn't really affect the exposure a whole bunch. It's just kind of my, my selection of what to put into the frame. So if you look at this pullback, you see the fall off right there? It was always there. It was just what I selectively chose to shoot. So no, I think the distance just chain a little bit, my distance. But the neat thing about it is if all my settings are manual, everything's going to stay the same. So I can move wherever I want. I can move across the street with like a telephoto lens and get like a really compressed shot so and can, all the light would stay the same. You can get, for, for instance, you can get the first <coughs> shot to be the, the, the one on the left and then you decide to go around. Let's just walk a couple of meters away or whatever and do creative stuff. But once you get the settings right for the first one, you can you just walk around, that's it. Exactly, that's exactly what it is. He was, he was saying, once you get the settings right, you just walk around, like it, it's, it's rocket science. I totally get your settings dialed in, get an exposure. Uh, this, I always joke about this, because people go out and they have this mindset, they're like, okay, I'm gonna get this shot. Okay, they get the model, they get their subject, they go out, they know what gear they're gonna use, they get their settings, they got it all. They get so excited and then they walk away, or they tear it down, or they start moving their lights. But if you take two seconds and walk around, or just ask your model to take two steps this way without changing anything else, nine times out of 10, you're gonna look at that picture and be like, it's either gonna be like better than the picture you thought it was gonna be, or at least it'll spark some ideas to keep working a location or a setup, saving you time because you're not 
redoing gear, redoing settings, redoing a setup, putting new, putting new soft boxes on. It's all about getting you more pictures and sparking your creativity on set and getting the most out of your lights rather than having to think, ah hey, man, I gotta buy two more flashes, I gotta buy more of this. It's like really learn the gear you got and then when you do go buy that other gear, you're gonna have a better understanding and you're gonna use it that much better too. So, any other questions? Yep. Can you use the Apollo and the Orb as a umbrella and reflective surface or is it just a soft box? Um, it's just a soft box, but it is reflective. I mean, there was no baffle on this, so I used it, oops, sorry, I used it similar to a bounce umbrella. See the light coming out? So I used it like just like a bounce umbrella, except it's deeper, so it's got a more focused beam of light. I did the same shot with a bounce umbrella, and I mean, I had light bleeding all over the place. So when I went back to frame it up differently like this, that dark line wasn't there because the light flew everywhere. So by using the orb, it only gave me that little spotlight of light, and then I got that line that fall off. So. Uh -huh. The orb without the diffuser, is it more yes. ring light in effect? Is ring light, it's more spectral, so it's a harsher light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit brighter too because you're not going through the front diffusion panel, right. so you're not eating up that light. Yep. The question was, um, without the front panel, does it look more ring light? Uh, it doesn't look more ring light, it just, you have more pronounced highlights, like they're sharper, they're more spectral. So you have like a harsh, like I said, if I have a shiny forehead under the light, you see like that really, that highlight right there, that's a spectral highlight. And when you don't use the front baffle, that doesn't get softened. So, so I'm a beauty dish. Beauty dish, yeah, beauty dish. Um, a beauty dish is a whole other beast, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a smaller, a smaller, harder, or smaller, harder light like that, yes. A little harsher. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah, uh-huh. So that, um, this is an action, but this is daylight. This goes back to, remember the kit. I said if I had one piece of equipment, it would be an umbrella. Now if I had two pieces of equipment, it would be an umbrella, and it would be like a four-in-one um, reflector kit, like this. Four-in-one, right? Yeah, it's the four-in-one. This is the sunlight one. So basically, in the kit, there's a shoot-through fabric that looks like the front diffusion panel of a softbox. And then on one side there's silver, which is highly reflective, and then there's like a weave of silver and gold, which warms it up a little bit. If I had two pieces of equipment, this is what I would own, because most of the time I'd rather use a reflector to bring in a fill light than set up a second strobe and softbox to be my fill light. So I get a lot of use out of these. And this picture right here is an example of, I was just walking around out in the afternoon, I wanted to take this photograph, but of course, if I got everything lit behind her, she went dark, or if I exposed her, everything out went white. You know, it's the normal problem we run into when we're, when we're shooting outdoors. So all I did was set up my speed light and hold this guy in front. I didn't, because I, I didn't have an Apollo or anything with me. I just had um, that kit on a carabiner on my belt and I was walking around with it. So I take out this guy, hold it up, shoot my flash through it, and I get that really nice soft light and I was able to balance that out. So this is why this is like definitely the second piece of equipment I would, uh, I would have on me at all times. There's that. And then, uh, so I mean, it's, it's great. Again, this is where you just add a little bit of fill to kind of augment a scene. Yep. What strategy do you use? That was pretty fast. That was using high speed sync. So I'm going to see if I can do, uh, if I can do a, um, a high speed sync here or advanced lighting one, because there's all kinds of fun stuff you can do with that. It's a good question. I know what high speed sync is, but how does that look professional? I don't know the exact bleed on it because when you when you do the question was if you do ND filter or high speed sync, high speed sync pretty much your flash is less effective but allows you to use faster higher or higher shutter speeds and then an ND filter just eats light like it's using a really low ISO. Um, so I don't know what's that? Yes, the, the autofocus is really goes goes to town there too. I mean, this same shot I could do at I could do with a speed light. I chose to use high speed sync here because I wanted the shallow depth of field. Yeah, if you saw from that last picture, I use this a lot. Um, if I'm just shooting around or I'm really quick and I go CLS mode, you know, you take it off and you just use your pop-up flash to control it. It's really cool because I always have a reflector with me just to bring it in and get almost that soft box look when two seconds ago I was shooting on camera flash. So that's one of the first things I use. I use the diffusion part of a reflector I, probably more than any other part of it. Just because it's really small and it turns into a mobile softbox. Uh, the next part is the silver part, which is pretty much the only other part that I use. Um, and the silver is great for, for beauty lighting. So if I have like a big, beautiful light up here that's nice and soft, but I want a little more pop in the eyes, I'll bring this underneath, which we're gonna set up here and show you. It's called clamshell beauty lighting. It's what they do for like the makeup commercials. It, um, if you look, 
here's my nice top lighting. This kind of brings it in and gets the catch lights underneath the bottom of my eyes and really fills it in. It's very flattering to use on women. If you have like a girlfriend or a friend or someone that's going to pose for you for like, you know, you got 20 minutes, you're always badgering me about taking pictures, you got 20 minutes. Go up, set up one light up high like this with a little reflector underneath her chin, ask her to hold it. Be like, just hold that here for two seconds. Take that picture and turn around the camera and show her. She's butter in your hands for like two hours. Like a woman cannot turn that down. So that's the way to really flatter someone and make a beautiful portrait yeah, like that. Still, if I want to do an extreme tilt, you do not have to put the uh, Apollo or the light stand through the hole in the Apollo. See what I did? I took it right outside. So now I can tilt this quite a bit. You won't have any green through that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, know, it's right, I was right at like five on the dot, so I'm trying to cut you out. Okay. The light is so powerful. With portable electronic flash, it's so powerful, the light just goes all over the place. So that gives us a nice... Beautiful. So I'll have you step right over this way, if you will. Butterfly light, where we're going. Is that high enough? Yeah, that should be perfect. Higher? Should be perfect. Mm -hmm. Can hold it? Yes, please. There you go. So actually, I'll have you hold this down first, so we'll get a shot without that. She's been through this before. It's like, this is my favorite kind of light. Well, if, you, if you ever want advice on light and you don't have a photographer sitting around to ask questions about, just ask a model. They've been through more lighting setups than most photographers have. Beautiful. And then we'll bring uh, one with it, like right under your chin, like really close. Beautiful. Just like that. So that right there. Classic butterfly light. Yeah. That's like, that's it's pretty much your textbook. You can see because you got the little, little highlight on her lip. And when he says butterfly lighting, he means, again, Classic lighting portrait isn't named after the light. It's named after the shadow. It's the little butterfly looking shadow that they create under her nose. That's what butterfly lighting comes from. So now that we brought that up, do the same thing. Beautiful. And now this is going to be the same thing with the reflector. So this is the, the other application that he's looking at. Look at that, how it just totally lightens it up. So I'll put those. We've got this guy. So that's, that's fine and dandy. That's a good shot. I just said fine and dandy, yeah. <laughs> and then if you compare the two, oh, trying to get them side by side. You got that guy, and then you have that. So it's like that right there is worth the 20 bucks for the reflector, I'll tell you what. So that's go-to right there. And then all you do is ask them to use it. Because, I mean, if you've had a model in front of your camera for two hours or two minutes, you know, chances are they're getting fidgety and stuff and they're bored and you say, hey, do you, can you help me hold this? I mean, they're jumping at the chance just to do something with their hands because they've been sitting there like this the whole time. So, sunlight side. The sunlight side? Okay, cool. And this is, um, this is Sunfire. I, um, sunlight. 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 Basically, this is the gold and silver weave. And for the longest time, I had this aversion to gold reflectors because every time I thought of one, I pictured like the 1980s swimsuit like shoots with like the gold, the gaudy gold, and you know the old magazine print. So I was like, oh, I'll never shoot a gold reflector. Um, but it's really cool if you do like the sunlight because it's just a little gold weave, so it just warms it up. Just like this gentleman asked if I if I use um, a warming gel on my flashes. Usually, I have a, at least a little bit of orange on my flash to warm it, and I really like this kind of reflector here because it does the same thing. Without having to put a warming gel on my flash, it's going to warm up the reflection of the light because it's got a little bit of gold weave in there. See how it warms it up a little bit? So if I had her on, like, say, a white background or something, you'd start to really get the feeling that, hey, this girl might be actually on the beach looking this good, like not sweating in the 100 degrees in the salt water, you know? You have to be careful with your white balance What's that? You have to be careful where your white balance is set. Yes. He, uh, Dave just mentioned you have to be careful where your white balance is set. I usually set it for flash or maybe sunlight a little bit, so that way it normally renders um, a little bit warmer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Can we get one more hand for our model? She's going to take off. Amazing. But really quick, not the touch on like the file technical boring stuff, shoot raw. If, you don't, if you're not comfortable shooting raw, start to learn. Shoot JPEG and raw, so you've got your JPEG files ready to go, but you can have something to play with. Because raw files, if anything else, they let you change your white balance later. So you take a bunch of pictures and you realize, oh my goodness, I didn't set my white balance right. They're all green. You can go back and change them later with no repercussions. So that's just my final piece of advice. Definitely try to shoot raw mode for portraits. So any questions? That's about, that's about all I got for you. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web. <laughs>